Well, what, what, one of the um, things that we found was uh, the environment in the bone marrow in CML seems to be disrupted. So patients seem to have a pro-inflammatory microenvironment, uh, often associated with excess tumor necrosis factor signaling. And, and what that seems to do is create an environment that, that drives the stem cells into quiescence, uh, so they're not dividing. And that seems to be an absolute key mechanism of the way they uh, evade the treatment. We are also running some real-world studies of um, patients with chronic myeloid leukemia uh, and myelofibrosis. These studies are really important because a lot of the uh, clinical trial data that we generate is really in highly selected um, patient groups based on stringent inclusion and exclusion criteria. And sometimes that raises um, issues relating to how applicable the clinical trial data is in the real world. And the, the second uh, reason for running uh, real world studies is, is to understand whether patients are managed according to guidelines that we develop. So we put a lot of effort into writing national and international guidelines for patients with CML and myelofibrosis, but we don't know whether those guidelines are followed. So collecting real-world data really helps to address both those issues. Are clinical trial data relevant in a real-world setting? And are patients with these diseases managed according to internationally agreed guidelines? Yeah, so I was giving a, a, a talk at a joint session on myeloproliferative neoplasms and CML and how we might improve individualized patient treatment for these diseases. One of the recent advances we've made in the field of chronic myeloid leukemia uh, is really identifying that there are some patients who can stop the treatment. And this is really a huge advance in the field and is now being introduced into routine clinical practice. But one of the big challenges in the field is that this can only really be applied uh, to a minority of, of patients. And that's primarily for two reasons. Number one, many patients don't achieve the really deep molecular remissions required to try an attempt at stopping the treatment, so-called treatment-free remission. Uh, and the second point is that um, even patients that do achieve those deep molecular remissions, about half of patients go on and, uh, uh, and, and their disease grows back, so they have to restart the treatment. And what we've been doing in the laboratory is using uh, single cell genomics to really try and begin understanding what, uh, what is the biology underlying why some patients respond really well to the treatment and some people don't, and what is the biology underlying stem cells that evade the treatment and cause the disease to relapse after patients stop the treatment. Yeah, so one of the interesting points raised during the panel discussion in our session related to the DESTINY study that was run uh, from uh, uh, Liverpool, actually, uh, by Professor uh, Clark. And, and that, that study used a different approach for discontinuing treatment in CML, uh, requiring patients to have a de-escalation phase for one year before stopping the treatment. And the results of that study are incredibly striking in that um, patients uh, had a higher rate of successful treatment-free remission uh, than has typically been observed in previous studies. And we had a discussion about the possible reasons that might underlie that um, improved rate of successful TFR. The bottom line is we don't really understand it, I think, is the bottom line, um, but we had a good discussion relating to that.